Here are a couple answers to a couple stupid questions from white guys. Oh yeah. <laughs> Hi everyone, it's Christy. Last week, the amazing atheist and some collaborators got together to do a spoof of the BuzzFeed's questions by X for Y. If you've watched the BuzzFeed videos, you'll know that they're a mix of sort of comedy by drawing on cultural stereotypes and then some serious questions about racial relations. The idea of the BuzzFeed videos is to throw in some comedy and some serious questions in order to get people thinking. When TJ did his video, he invited other white males to collaborate so that it's an exclusively white male video directed at SJWs. Instead of being funny and bringing up some serious issues, all of the speakers, basically except maybe one, use it as an opportunity to be really snarky and condescending and patronizing and insulting. In the spirit of collaboration, I've asked a few of my friends who have been called SJWs to help me answer the not serious and genuine questions of most of the people in this video. Why do you claim to speak for LGBT people, women, and ethnic minorities, but when LGBT people, women, and ethnic minorities disagree with you, you harass them? TJ, I don't think you understand what an ally is. An ally doesn't claim to speak for people. They are speaking the same values as other people are speaking in support of those people. I'm an ally to LGBT people when I raise the awareness and concern about attempts of Christian privilege to infringe upon their civil rights. And I'm speaking as an American when I express my concern at the clearly racial nature of police shootings in the United States. And I am adding my voice in support to the Black Lives Matters movement and its goals of putting cameras on cop uniforms, ending the militarization of police, using fines as a source of city revenue. All of these things are great ideas and could help really solve some problems. I'm not speaking for people, I'm adding my voice and support to theirs. I'm on the LGBTQ spectrum. I speak for myself and I'm grateful for the support of my allies. As a minority, I'm very glad that there are people who advocate for human rights of others, even when they're not personally affected. I have to say that I find this question demeaning. It ignores the many LGBTQ people and the many people of color who are at the very forefront of this social justice movement, who are defining figures within it. I've seen this kind of thinking when it comes to all of us. As if gay people and black people and Latino people just sit around while the white cis straight guys do the work, like children who let the parents do the thinking for them. It's crap. We contribute, we research, we organize, we teach and instruct and lead even. Fancy that. As far as people harassing others, I would never do that or condone it. I would like to know who these people are in the social justice movement, what you accuse them of specifically, and what your evidence is that they have done these things. So, if necessary, I can go give them a piece of my mind. So, TJ, listen, I did answer that one question, but it's the last question of yours that I'm going to answer. I think you've made it very clear after you doxed Martin Hughes and then refused to debate him on your statements that black people live in a victim cult, or that black culture is a victim cult, and that you refuse to stand by that, but also didn't walk away from it. So I've answered that question because it is relating to LGBTQ, and I've answered it specifically as a person who is LGBTQ, but I'm certainly not going to play any games with you regarding your racism. You can play word games or go, oh, this is more racist than that, or that is more racist. You know, find any way you want to turn the tables around, but it's obvious you don't want to engage, you don't want to debate. You just want to mug for the camera and pander to your audience, and I will not be playing that game. And I don't think that anybody else will either. It's up to them what they want to do. We don't. While all three of us here at TSF are on the LGBTQ spectrum, Ivy's out doing some business, the only instance of us speaking for the community is when we make bold claims like 
throwing gay men off buildings is ethically unjustifiable. <gasps> or corrective rape of lesbians is an atrocity. <gasps> yeah, yeah. We, we don't harass anyone that we know of. Um, if we're antagonistic towards someone who comes to our channel or tags us, we do not take their orientation into account when constructing one of our trademark devastating retorts. And as for harassment, I don't do harassment online. Unlike... Well, you deserved it, so fuck you. I hope it happens again soon. I hope you fucking drown in rape semen, you ugly, mean-spirited cow. You're lucky it wasn't me. I'd have busted your fucking nose and raped you. Rape isn't fatal, so imagine my indignation when I saw a chat room called Rape Survivors. Is this supposed to impress me? Someone fucked you when you didn't want to be fucked and you're amazed you survived? Do you realize that your war on language through political correctness has made you bedfellows with true rape culture? In other words, Islam, the world's most misogynistic ideology. There are just so many fallacies. This is such a clear straw man. It's not even attempting to be an honest effort at presenting a critique. It's just propaganda. Another shot and a miss. We use our platform, such as it is, to promote ex-Muslims, along with their humanist criticisms of toxic ideologies. Maybe we need to have a social justice warrior or two on the show, because your own tribalistic ideology is clearly clouding your perceptions. Now, it's funny, because this reminded me of a very similar argument from a movie called God's Not Dead, a subplot from a Christian fundamentalist film about a Muslim girl who wanted to convert to Christianity and they ham-handedly tried to show that Christianity wasn't misogynistic and it was Islam that was and they tried to further that point by having the Muslim teenager be being beat the crap out of by her father for listening to a Christian song on her iPod. I find it a bit disingenuous when you use a subplot that's in a Christian fundamentalist move, movie as your argument. And you're skeptical atheists? Not to mention the political correctness thing. That was even an argument that was made by one of the Duck Dynasty guys in the movie, saying that he preys on his show because it's not politically correct war on Christian stuff. Do you want women to be equal or do you want women to be a protected class? You can't have both. Now, Armored Skeptic, I don't know if you realize this, I don't think you do, but the word protected class actually has a specific meaning in law, and it's designed for those groups that are experiencing unequal treatment systematically. So actually the term protected class refers to the fact that people are equal, but institutionally they're not getting that fair treatment. Therefore, your claim that a protected class is a contradiction to um, equality just shows that you don't actually understand the terms that you're using. Personally, I'm strongly in favor of an equal rights amendment being passed in America. I'm American. It should be updated for modern understandings, of course. If you expect society to treat women as equal with men, why don't women have to take responsibility for their own safety? Okay, I'm gonna take this one. You what? realize we teach self-defense, right? Yes, we teach <laughs> self-defense for a reason. We teach self-defense to all people, not just women, so that you can be better prepared in a situation where you may need to use it. Also, men and women can both be a protected class and a respected class. Any feminists that object to self-defense training, unless they are talking about the fact that it's necessary and that sucks, like they're complaining about the general atmosphere of violence toward women. Other than that, why would they have a problem with it? If by safety you're talking about domestic abuse and rape, my first question to you is why are you ignoring all of the male victims of domestic abuse and rape in that question when you're just framing it as women are the only ones who are victims? As to the second part of your question, well, there are women's safety courses. I know I was trained in how to protect myself. So you seem to be setting up a really unfair false dichotomy that doesn't make your argument very convincing. What are you afraid will happen when you leave your safe space? Arg! there'll be dragons. 
<laughs> Guys, do you not inform yourself of things you talk about at all? Safe spaces are not 24-7 environments, and I for one manage to live my day-to-day -day life just fine. When it comes to safe spaces, to give a for instance, when I worked with people with opioid addictions, I would ask extremely personal, difficult, painful questions, and they would answer them, honestly, because they knew they were in a safe space, a place where they weren't going to be judged, but instead be supported and helped, and they knew that there would be privacy and respect for their particular circumstances and needs. That's what safe spaces are for. My awareness of other safe spaces that occur on college campuses include things like a place for young mothers to go to breastfeed their children, which are private and calm and safe and just a clean, nice environment, which can be hard to come by. You have to understand that the university of today is like a small town. It's a huge place with a lot of people and a lot of stuff going on and a lot of tension. So, you know, it makes sense to have different places like this where they can go if they have particular needs. How can you possibly justify the idea that it's somehow racist to disagree with Black Lives Matter, and yet it's not racist when a black person tweets something like, kill all white people. I'm kind of surprised I have to explain this to you, TJ. Black Lives Matter is a group with political goals. So when you disagree with Black Lives Matter, you have to explain what you're disagreeing with. For instance, they want to see body cams on police. Do you disagree with that? They are aiming to see a reduction in the militarization of the police. Do you disagree with that? They are aiming to stop municipalities from relying on fines that disproportionately impact low-income people as a way to fund their budgets. Do you disagree with that? So when you just say, I disagree with Black Lives Matter and you just reject it as a group, you're certainly, maybe I wouldn't call it racist, but you're sh certainly showing a massive rejection of what are some really sensible policies. Now take that group that has political goals and has a website and there you have spokespeople and compare it to one person on Twitter who says something that might be humorous, it might be serious, they might be mentally ill. I don't know what's going on. But do you see how these two things are completely different? You're using a logical fallacy of false analogy and you're supposed to be a rationalist. You need to work on that. Here's a question. Are you aware that the present is not the past? I'm not kidding. Are you familiar with the concept of linear time? Because you seem incredibly comfortable traveling back through time to talk about how bad things were for women, or black people, or whoever. And then by using some form of SJW magic, you then claim or imply that those problems in the past exist today. Are you aware that this trick that you're doing is not working? Why do you think that would work? Really? Time moves forward in a linear progression? Mind blown. That explains so much. Who came up with this question again? Dude, crack is whack. Uh, it's pointless because it happened in the past. And it's a trick. Explaining causes and effects is a trick. The phrase history repeats itself. That's a trick. Howard Zinn trying to talk about events that happened in the past and how they correlate and how they evolve and how the nature changes and why the state lines look the way they do. That's a trick. I'm sure Confucius would have said something very similar. All right, I'll throw out, I'll just throw out all my history books now because I don't need to learn about anything about past events and how they've that correlated to the problems that we have today and how the attitudes have evolved and changed and grown. God, history professors, you're doing it wrong. You've been teaching everybody wrong. Just, here's how you should teach the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, all right? Here's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna say it happened, and that's it. Because it's in the past, and we don't have to talk about how the causes and the effects of something like that, you know, like with the arms race and the Cold War and the fact that Nagasaki and Hiroshima are still grieving over the fact because it was just like a couple generations ago and they still have nuclear waste like and problems around there. Nah, just talk about it as if it doesn't correlate to the past. 
I would have heard that question when I was 14. In my freshman year. Why are we learning about the Roman Empire? Past is in the past. It's not the present. Bill and Ted have a better concept of history than you do. I take it you've never heard of the concept of path dependence. Path dependence is a concept used routinely by economists to account for the current situation based on decisions made in the past. Quick example, in the 80s we had a rivalry between VHS and Betamax as formats for watching movies. Because of the decisions of video producers, sellers, and consumers, the market veered over toward preferring VHS. And as a consequence, Betamax died out and VHS won the day. People who came along after that decision started buying their videos didn't have a choice between Betamax and VHS because of decisions other people had made in the past. Clearly, if there are institutionalized practices in, say, the judicial system, where the people involved have norms about sentencing black men more harshly than white men and sentencing men more harshly than women, these practices are reproduced as new people come into that institution unless those practices are identified as problematic, solutions to them are found, and the culture has changed. That wasn't so hard, was it? Do you really think you can spend your entire life in a state of perpetual emotional immaturity? Do you actually imagine that you will be able to stretch out your adolescence for your entire existence? coming from you, Sargon, the man who lives in the Twittersphere and has to harass people from behind a pseudonym. This is hilarious. So hilarious. Okay, maybe I was too quick to judge number six. This one is just as dumb, but twice as dickish. Congratulations. <sighs> this is going to be a really long list. Yeah, I got this one. This one's all mine, baby. Okay, so we're immature, but we're... <laughs> That was Ivy. Ivy's back. <laughs> there are 13% more women in college right now than men. So if the whole goal of feminism is equality, shouldn't we have some men-only scholarships in order to equal everything out? Um, are you talking about two-year colleges and four-year colleges? Are you including trade schools in terms of higher education or post-secondary education? Are you looking at it by degree scheme at all? Are you talking about the United States, Canada, Australia? Britain, citation needed. Point one, there are men-only scholarships. Did you even bother to look that up before you made the video? And secondly, men-only scholarships doesn't actually address the problem that you've set up in the first part of your question. Sex differences in who attends university isn't going to be solved by a scholarship unless you're saying the finances of men are the reason why they can't get into higher education. The idea of a scholarship is to allow people who don't have enough in terms of financial resources to get the education they need, but it doesn't help you get admitted to the university, it doesn't help your grades, and it doesn't help people stay in university if they decide to drop out after a year or two. I really have to wonder why you thought this was a coherent question to begin with. If feminism and egalitarianism are both for equal rights, then why does one start with a gendered prefix while the other one is entirely gender neutral? Oh, finally, an honest question. Okay, let's break this down. Egalitarianism is a principle of human equality, but it doesn't say anything or it doesn't allow us to analyze human equality through any particular experience or lens, as it were. If we want to critique human equality in society and law in terms of heterosexual and homosexual acceptance, that would be associated with the gay rights movement. So gay rights is egalitarianism applied to the question of sexual identity and orientation. Egalitarianism as applied to issues of racial equality, whether or not certain groups based on their ethnic background hold more power in society or have disproportionate power over other people in that society, the issues of racial equality, that is egalitarianism applied to the question of ethnicity. 
and you know where I'm going with this, egalitarianism, when it is looked at through the lens of power and social status as assigned according to the person's biological sex or gender norms in a society, that's feminism. So feminism starts with the assumption that men and women are equal and then evaluates societies to point out the ways in which we don't practice that equality. What do you hope to gain by bringing back racial segregation? <laughs> what do you hope to gain by bringing back racial segregation? The world. And the other half of a golden amulet. No! Speaking out against injustice is not trying to bring back racial segregation. And if that's what you think, and I don't think you think that because I know you being disingenuous. I like that in the first question you were really concerned about LGBT people, ethnic minorities, and women, and now you're not. Yes, asking and addressing injustice, asking for justice, racial segregation, there you go. We are... <laughs> We are completely against racial and indeed sexual segregation, Muslims, Jews, other people who Christians. segregate. Oh, those, see, I, it was right on the tip of my tongue. No matter who the segregation is proposed by, we're, we're, we're against it. I have to answer that question with a question. Could you be a little bit more specific? Like, who the fuck are you talking about? What do you mean by racial segregation? What element of feminism or SJWs are you talking about that want to bring back racial segregation? Are you aware of the fact that due to the war on drugs, a lot of people in prison are black, and that's a kind of a form of racial segregation, and from what I've seen, SJWs want to end that war on drugs, and they want to stop black people from filling up the prisons due to small-time drug offenses. And I actually think some of you guys who are on the straw man fest against SJWs would agree with that. So, all right, we agree. And in that respect, we want to end racial segregation. When we talk about gentrification, that ends up pushing black people into ghettos or other neighborhoods. That's a form of racial segregation. And the SJWs are kind of against that. So, I mean, you're going to have to be a little bit more specific. I think this could be that weird argument they make where they say, when gentrification, for example, happens, fuck the black people, they can just go die in the gutter. Who gives a shit? And if we have homeless people, I guess just, like, stick them in prison or some crap. And that's, like, their version of no segregation. No segregation is a world in which black people are free to be discriminated against. And with a drug war, I guess, even though you guys disagree with the drug war, I think, is fine. You're like, there's no argument here. There's no substance. If you were going to ask a f question like, Why do you want to bring back racial segregation? Say, who wants to bring back racial segregation? Because you're just talking to your fucking echo chamber crowd. What does that look like? What r racial segregation? And who are you asking? Who? Who are you talking to? <sighs>
the substance of this is a direct comparison of Islam to Nazism. And I think there's a certain argument to be made that ideas in the Quran and ideas of Islam obviously are misogynistic and backwards and wrong, anti-scientific, anti-woman, and they are oppressive, and that's why I'm... I think it's bullshit, and um, I'm not religious, and I don't believe in Islam, and I, I think it's obviously wrong. But to, to compare Islam to Nazism, it's a convenient way of making a non-argument to make yourself feel better, because the fact is, if there were the amount of Nazis in the world today that there are Muslims, I think we would have seen a significantly larger amount of massacres, including death camps, and just like pure carnage, chaos, and death. This is not a relative privation thing. I'm not saying because Nazism is so much worse in practice than Islam, that Islam does not have tons of problems, and that that's no consolation to like a gay person when they're getting thrown off a fucking wall in Saudi Arabia. But I don't know any SJWs who think like Saudi Arabia is actually like the ideal society and it's a wonderful place. But I also know in Saudi Arabia when they're throwing gay people off walls and shit, that doesn't really have much to do with like random Muslims who live in America, even if they have some problematic ideas about how things work. But if they were all Nazis, I mean, you can rest assured that the world dominance that Islam supposedly wants would be far more advanced if it was Nazism, because Nazism is extremely militaristic in a, in a fashion that Islam is not, quite frankly. And, and I know, this is like nuance. This is actually like thinking about the dimensions of things. Islam and Nazism are not one-to-one. -one. That, that's kind of a bunk comparison. But I mean, there's certain elements of each which are problematic, to use like a, a feminist phrase there. And because I'm willing to say that, that kind of nuance, that parts overlap and then parts don't, and that it would be worse for the world if Nazism was as prominent as Islam, that means I think Islam is perfect. And there's no problems with Islam. I think it's fantastic, and I think when they throw great people off buildings, great, that's really good. And I love it when they fucking whip women and shit, and I love it when they get forced to wear the burqa. And you know what? I think, you know, the Armenian Genocide, it was just chuckles. It was fantastic. No. This is a symptom of the stupidity of YouTube and internet-based thinking where you cannot think about, you know, the multiple levels and details of things. Because, honestly, you're too emotional. You're too batshit about this. You can't think, like, okay, there's actually, like, different tiers of information here. Nazism is not exactly the same as Islam, but there are problematic overlapping elements to it. This is not a controversial statement. This is not an apology. This is a fucking fact. If you're going to bring up Nazis and compare it to something, you should compare it to a system which necessarily leads to genocide. The Khmer Rouge, Pol Pot, that's a very valid analogy. Stalinism. And Stalinism is not the same as all communism, but it was definitely a uh, variant of communism which led, led to genocide. The three Pashas in Turkey, um, near the turn of the century who carried out the Armenian genocide, I would say that those people with their right-wing ideology, that leads to um, genocide. If you want to compare some part of Islam that's similar to the Nazis, I think a direct comparison to the Committee of Union and Progress who carried out the Armenian genocide, who were Muslims, is a 100% totally valid analogy. Compare like to like. You can't compare a Nazi party to an entire religion of 1.8 billion people or whatever. And if, if the problem is just that Muslims have some fucked up views, do they have the monopoly on fucked up views? I mean, how come it's just their fucked up views are the Nazi ones? But when you get a whole bunch of fucking white racist cunts, you're willing to overlook that and you're like, no, that's just the KKK. It's not white people. You see, that would actually be logical to say, yes, the KKK have a Nazi-like point of view, that th these fascist parties in Saudi Arabia have a Nazi-like point of view. Islamic extremists have a Nazi-like point of view. These conservative Islamic leaders have a Nazi-like point of view, and that's shit, and we hate it. But it doesn't make sense to say, Muslims have a Nazi-like point of view. Well, then how come, you know, all Muslims are not out there putting everybody in camps? And again, I mean, all Muslims is not equal to 
Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan. Oh, God. Deep thinking is regressive. It's my opinion that they abstain from actual responses to my criticism because by even replying to it, they are forced to confront nuance. And they truly have no argument against nuance. How could they? Looking at the world without caring about details or context is completely indefensible as a position unless the argument is simply ignorance is bliss.